Abibi Fahode African family is Bama Deli with my amazing wife Naila. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about voting and specifically why voting is a, a fool's errand for yeah. any African who is seriously concerned about their liberation. Yeah, so. so when we talk about this, we um, want to use an analogy because analogies, they simplify things and they make it very crystal clear to yeah. those who are under the influence of propaganda. So we like to use the analogy of a corporation. So imagine if you was an employee, a kind of low level employee at a major corporation, right. and you was dissatisfied with the work environment. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the likelihood that if you appeal to the shareholder of that corporation, that they will respond to you favorably? Or, or that you would even know who the shareholders are. Right, like, right. They don't, would even, you, they you don't know, know you. Right. Would you be on close personal terms with any of the shareholders? No. Would you know them by first name? Would they know you by first name? Would they care to know you by first name? Yes, no. they don't want to know anything about you. Right. The shareholders, they're specifically interested in the profits of that corporation. Right. So anything that's happening within the workplace among the employees is of no concern to them. Mm -hmm. They're there to just increase the profits. Right. So uh, in the same way, the likelihood that a shareholder will respond to an employee that's the likelihood that the American system or the people who own the shares in the American government right. are going to respond to black voters. Exactly. And they have no, as in a low level employee, you have no stake in the company. You're just right. there to produce and make the company money. They right. don't, they can replace you at any point. Right. And that's how you're looked at in America as a black person. You don't have any wealth to be able to enter the conversation. Mm -hmm. And you also have to ask yourself, why are these white people who have never cared about us before, who abuse us, kill us in the street, beat our um, our husbands in front of us, killed our babies, why would they want us to now all of a sudden they want us to vote? Like they're pushing us to vote or you to vote, should I say, so hard. Mm -hmm. Like why is that? Like you have to ask yourself, if we are looking at white people or Yorugu or Europeans as our enemies, mm -hmm. why would our enemies tell us to do something that's going to really benefit us like it doesn't make sense and the you can tell they're overcompensating by getting these celebrities mm -hmm. getting all these tv shows all these commercials all this advertising that they're spending on just vote just just getting black people specifically to believe in voting like mm -hmm. they're trying very hard to get you to believe that your vote matters and that's when you should be like that's when you should sit back and be like wait a minute let me analyze this because it's not in their interest to care about me. Mm -hmm. It's not in their they they clearly don't. We're being killed in the streets for fun, mm -hmm. and so I think when you start asking the question about voting, you have to start looking at what your enemies are telling you to do. Right. If your enemies are telling you to vote, right. more than likely, right. voting is not the solution. Right, and we have to begin diagnosing the type of culture in which we live exactly. because a lot of times we get so wrapped up into the political realities that we forget that every political system in existence mm -hmm. is the product of a culture. Right. So we have to ask, is the culture you know, in which these politicians exist, is it an African culture? Mm -hmm. And if it's not an African culture, then your antenna should be up because yeah. you're being exploited. You're being exploited and you're, you're being, being used and they're using you to further the idea that you have a voice. Yes. And they're making you also tell other people that they have a voice. Meanwhile, you've been lied to about your voice being heard. So it's like all these people who don't have any stake in America are telling each other that their voice matters and their vote counts. You're looking at all of these African or black organizations in America that are advising you to vote. They don't have stakes. They, they're not making the amount of money that will cause you to be, or that will enable you to have any say in America. You, you have to be a billionaire for your, for your. Uh, you have to be lineage to some type of family. It's the old, it's the oligarchy. Yes. Like we know this. Yes. Let's not pretend like it's not. Yes. So it, unless you have, unless you're connected to some wealthy Yoruba family, or you're, and you have billions of dollars. There's no reason for you to talk, be talking about voting. That's no, it has nothing to do with you. Right. It's been like that from the beginning. It has. From, this from is the it. origins of America. Right. If you look at the Constitutional Convention, one of the so-called founders, James Madison, stated that the purpose of government was to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. 
And at that time, the majority included a large share of oh, poor whites. Yes, white so people. So we have to ask ourselves if the founders of the nation um, explicitly wanted to exclude poor whites from the national um, growth, why would they all of a sudden want to include poorer Africans? That's very, to, to kind of believe that that's the case is to just throw history out the yeah, window yeah. And, and operate purely on fantasy and wishful thinking. Yeah, and we see that with a lot of things, honestly, when we, a lot of subjects that we talk about. Is you're literally just throwing history out the window, and yes. you're, you're literally living in the now, you're living in social media, mm -hmm. and you're living in what other people who don't have a stake in America are telling you right. to do. And it's just, it's very sad to watch our people have so much energy and so much, com so much passion mm -hmm. for something that is so counterproductive. Yes, like, it's meaningless. It's very ritual. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. what it is—a meaningless ritual that's supposed to make you feel a sense of belonging, but with no real substance. None, under, none. Like know. I said, if they're spending all this time and energy telling you to do something, I want to do the opposite. You're telling me to vote. Now I know that voting has not, is not going to benefit me because right. my enemy is telling me to do it. Right. So once we get that fundamental idea down that what they're telling us to do, we should not want to do it. We should want to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. We're going to just continue to fall into their tracks, fall into their propaganda. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be so easy to manipulate and drain us of our energy because we're, just, we're uh, allocating so much energy into standing in lines mm -hmm. and posting pictures and mm -hmm. posting Status is about voting and arguing with our family members and mm -hmm. people that like no yes, it's yes. <laughs> it's yes. just it's very sad yes and and as with all topics we discuss mm -hmm. we bring a, a great deal of research yeah and <laughs> and I would like to direct our viewers and our listeners to the uh, economic state of Black America mm -hmm. this was a report published by the United Snakes Senate. Um, in the year 2020. We want you to write in the comments, what percentage of the nation's wealth in America do you think belongs to African people? So right below, as of right now, 2020, what do you think the percentage of African people hold when it comes to the wealth in America? Pause the video and put it, put your number, your percentage below, and also tell us what do you think that percentage would be in the year 2050? Correct. So, Go ahead and do that, and then you'll come back, unpause the video, and then we'll tell you what the statistic is. And you can see if you are close, if you're far off, and that can kind of help you gauge whether you're engaged really with what's going on or if you're kind of going off of what is being given to us. Because what's being given to us and what's reality are, are always vastly different. Vastly different right. Yes, yes. So pause the video and come back. If, if your number for the percentage of wealth owned by Africans within America exceeded 5%, congratulations, you overestimated. <laughs> so five, I, hold on, let's say that number again. 5%. Five five less than 5%. Less than 5%. And I'll read directly from the report. Again, this is the economic state of black America uh, in 2020. And this can be found online for anybody who wants to verify. And it says, Black households have never held more than 5% of the nation's total wealth, while white households held 85% in 2019, despite blacks making up around 13% of the population. And then it goes on to add, a 2016 study found that Americans underestimated the size of the black-white wealth gap by 80 percentage points. And then it says, uh, while black and Hispanic household wealth continues to fall, so it's declining from 5%. At the current pace of decline, median household wealth could reach zero by the year 2053. Zero. So we're in, a, we're in a situation, Africans um, uh, in America at least, are in a situation where they own less than 5% of the nation's wealth. Historically, they've never owned more than 5%. That small percentage is on the decline at such a rate by 2053, it will be at zero. And this is including all the celebrities, yes. all the billionaires, all the black excellence, all the black excellence <laughs> that y'all love. This is including them, yes. 5%. So really, they're taking up probably, what, yes. 3%? Right. And the rest, uh, the rest, the other 2% is just average. Yes. Come on. So we have no. to ask ourselves, is all the energy that Africans in America are spending in election season worth the 5% of wealth mm -hmm. that they own collectively? 
Now, the only reason you would expend that much energy in a political process in which you own no wealth is if you identify with the people who own the wealth. If you're culturally misoriented, if yep. you identify yourself as the yep. and if that's the case, then we have a bigger problem at stake. Because not only are we wasting our political capital, but we're under spiritual uh, intoxication. We're spiritually uh, uh, dead. We don't know who we really are. And you know how many, you know the percentage of people that should be voting and should be telling other black people to vote? 5%. Yes. Yes, if you, or unless you own a share of that 5%, it makes no sense to vote. And the founders understood this. They understand Former this. presidents like Jimmy Carter, who described America as an oligarchy, right. understand this. And But they understand the power of what they say. They mm -hmm. can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. They can't tell you, um, actually, the only people who vote matters are the people with money. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about voting. Like They have to further mm -hmm. the, the illusion. Mm -hmm. And part of doing that is putting a lot of advertising dollars towards voting campaigns. Mm -hmm. So what's what's the main point we're trying to push here? And I'll I'll say our first point that we want to make in this video is voting and your rubles of elections represent a conspiracy to destroy the political sovereignty of Africans worldwide. Or the way I like to put it is a lot of times when we think of elections, we think, oh, this is the um, process where we get to choose the president. No. Elections aren't where you choose the president. Elections are where you choose to participate in a public ritual where someone else is choosing. It shows where your loyalty lies. It shows yes. where your beliefs lie. It shows that you are vastly mm -hmm. dedicated to America surviving. Yes. If you go out and vote, you don't. You can't ask for reform. Mm -hmm. You can't ask for things to change mm -hmm. if you're participating in voting. Mm -hmm. Because and because it, what it is it, it the underlying thing that you have to go that you have to have in order to walk into a voting station mm -hmm. is belief mm -hmm. a belief in a system mm -hmm. and what we're saying is you should have no belief mm -hmm. in that system mm -hmm. and, and the magic of it of the whole of the the kind of manipulative genius of it is mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter who you vote for yeah. so you could have an actual candidate who represents exactly what you want but if you put um, cast your ballot in favor of that candidate, you're also casting your ballot in favor of that system. You know, you're casting your ballot in favor of that culture. And that's the, the that's the advantage, the psychological advantage of voting is it gives you the illusion of choice while hiding and, and, and taking you and depriving you of the choice of uh, abolishing the system. Right. There's right. no way to vote a system out of existence. So every time you vote, you're prolonging the existence mm -hmm. of that system of power. Yeah. So, and, and, and the reason why we don't kind of see that reality is because we don't ask those type of questions. We never ask the question whether the system of America is legitimate. Mm -hmm. We ask, are the representatives of that system legitimate? Right, right. We're looking at the spider web and not right. the spider that right. created the web. Right. And, so and we, we have to go ahead. And, and we think that uh, somebody in office can be legitimate because yeah. they're black. Right. What? Right. No, absolutely not. If you're running for presidency in America, you are illegitimate. <laughs> right. If you're running for any office in America, governor, any any of it, it doesn't matter if you're black, illegitimate. Right. And I think one thing that will really help us, because a, a kind of cliche that is kind of circulated among black people a lot of times during election seasons, they say, well, you know, our uh, ancestors fought and died for us to have the right to vote. Now, that sounds good, but like most cliches among uh, a pun, a uh, close examination, it falls apart instantly. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just take the most uncontroversial uh, proponent of voting, Dr. Martin Luther King. He's often kind of portrayed as a person whose um, sole achievement or whose shining achievement was the Open Rights Act in 1964. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But most people, they stop after that legislation was passed yeah. because they don't want to acknowledge that in 65, 66, 67, he moved his agenda away from gaining the franchise and put it towards economic um, um, justice for Africans within America. And why was it important for Africans in America to have economic justice? Because it was, as he said, he realized that he had integrated Americans into a burning, burning house. house. And that burning house includes the fact that if you're in the voting booth without any economic power, your vote is meaningless. 
So he saw that even Martin King, as, as many uh, mistakes as he made and as much criticism as we have for him, later in his life he understood that you can't lead people into the voting booth without an understanding of how the system, system of power yeah, operates. Right. You can't just voluntarily give your uh, approval to a system mm -hmm. that is at a fundamental level based Correct. on your annihilation. You know, and, and, and Dr. King's um, uh, warning that he was integrating his people into a burning house, it finds further support in the uh, writings of Baba Malinu Baruchi. Mm -hmm. And he calls uh, what we call integrationism, he calls it sub-integrationism. Yeah, because that's what it was. And sub-integrationism is different from what we call integrationism because it, it requires you to submit to European culture. That's what integration was. And, and that's what our participating in elections is. It's mm -hmm. a way of, uh, it's, it's the way Yorugu tests our loyalty. It's a loyalty open. Yep. It's, it's, it's trying to get um, Africans within America to um, show that they haven't tapped into that part of their African, African mind yep. nope. where they want to just rip the system down. Nope. Where they understand that you can't have, because in America they say it's a democracy and it operates off consent of the government. Mm -hmm. But the origins of African in America was a non-consensual act of right. kidnapping and rape. Mm -hmm. So you can't have the origin of your existence in the country kidnapping and rape and then tell the descendants of those people who were kidnapped and raped to that vote. they're in participating in a government on the basis of consent. Because we didn't consent to be here. Right. We yeah. are our ancestors. We didn't consent to be there. We didn't consent to um, voting between two evils. Nope. You know, we, we didn't to, have no option. Where is the African option in yeah. the election? So we have to understand. And where are these elect? What? Where are they coming from? Who's yes. deciding that they even get to be yes. potential presidents? Yes. That ain't that didn't come from you. Yes. So you're not really voting. They they're, they're giving you options and saying pick. Mm. That's not that's mm. not a choice. Mm. Like come on, like let's really ask ourselves. Are they going to put somebody in power that's going to liberate you? So, so what's the second point we're, we're driving here? And the second point is voting has historically been and continues to be a contest among property holders, mm -hmm. i.e. Yorugu. Mm -hmm. All legislation otherwise is an application of the Yorugu rhetorical ethic, and that's something we talked about with um, Nana Marimba Ani. Right. If this were not the case, it would be reflected in the distribution of national power, mm -hmm. meaning Africans would own more than 5% right. of the nation's wealth right. if voting was of any significance mm -hmm. to them. The fact that they own less than 5% and is declining is telling you in an indirect way that voting is meaningless. It is. It's meaningless. Right. So, so any, and furthermore, any criticism and debate about voting rests upon the unprincipled assumption that repatriation is either inconceivable yeah. or should be taken off the table as unworthy of serious consideration. Yeah, because nobody that's repatriating is worried about voting. Right. Like, right. That has nothing to do with me. Right. That's not my country. That's right. not my home. Right. I, my, this is my home. Right. So I think people who, you can kind of tell the type of people who vote. They usually, mm -hmm. they're going to practice European holidays. Mm -hmm. They're going to be against repatriation mm -hmm. because they think that they can somehow become mm -hmm. wealthy enough to live a fulfilling life in America, mm -hmm. which is not possible. Mm -hmm. But it's like they have the same type of characteristics. And what we're saying is just steer clear of mm -hmm. those type of people. Mm -hmm. Just steer clear. And, and I'll, to even build on the analogy, so the corporate analogy, I can remember when I had a nine to five. Mm -hmm. We didn't have unions, but one of the kind of concessions or kind of imaginary uh, kind of power uh, concessions they gave us was they uh, surveyed the employees. They would, so they would ask you to report to your superiors what do you like and don't you like mm -hmm. about the regular work day. And I remember I never used to fill out the surveys. Mm -hmm. Is it because I thought the workplace was perfect? No. I hated the workplace. But I felt by participating in the survey, I was tacitly saying that I want to stay yeah, here. Yeah, I want to stay here and I wanted to improve. You and, and he knew that it was nothing to improve. Right. It was functioning the way right. it was supposed to function. Right. You so, were underpaid for a reason, right. so the company can make money. They're not gonna raise like right. they're not gonna raise your salary up enough okay. for you to really be able to make something mm -hmm. of yourself and make enough money to leave the company. Mm -hmm. No. Why would they do that? Mm -hmm. Why would they do that? Same reason why he wasn't 
um, going to the shareholders and asking them for, for favors. Right. And that's what you're doing when you're voting. Right. You're saying, hey, I need this done and I want this neighborhood to come up and I need these certain things in our neighborhoods. And I, Why? Why is that a priority to people with billions of dollars? Right. Right. <laughs> it's not a priority of theirs. Right, right. The shareholders only communicate with the board of directors. Yeah. And the board of directors, that's the presidents and mm -hmm. the governors right. and the senators. Right. That's the board of directors. The shareholders are the people you don't see. Right. That's the people who are controlling what They're you control. consume. Right. Controlling what you watch, controlling yeah. what you eat. Controlling the debates. Controlling the debates, <laughs> the so called debates, which, as we stated in the other videos, it's actually dual, the European dual. Right. So we have to kind of break out of this fiction yeah. that we're actually uh, that we actually have a seat at the table. You do not. We have to flip the table. You're not even in a parking we're lot. Not, we're not even in the parking lot. You know, while we're fighting to get in the room, we don't understand that everybody in the room carries a disease that is uniquely designed to kill Africans. And you know? another analogy that we talked about the other day, remember when we were talking, we were like a fast food restaurant. <laughs> so we're America, let's say America's a fast food restaurant and the shareholders are the people that you don't see. Yeah. At, black people in America aren't even the employees at the front desk right. taking orders. Right. They're the hamburgers. Right, because the employee can form unions. Yeah. They, we're the, we're the, the product that we're America the product. is selling. You, we were sold with cloth and coffee shops. Yes. And that coffee shop is still existing today. Right. So you, they're looking at us like, what? I didn't know mm -hmm. merchandise could talk. Right. That's what they're looking at. They're like, right. Right. just tell them that their vote matters right. so they can shut get the out, hell up, get out of the get way, of the way and up. let the people with the money do all the right. the talking. Right. They're like, they can't understand. They're trying to figure out, well, they understood now because they're playing into it mm -hmm. by telling you to vote. But for the longest time, they couldn't understand why we even were talking. They're mm -hmm. like... Did you know merchandise and hamburgers? Can yeah, talk? livestock. Can livestock talk? can talk. I yeah. never knew that before. Yeah. They were very confused. The difference is they know how to adapt to what we want. Mm -hmm. We ask for things, and they're like, "Let's pretend like we're giving it to them right. by telling them to vote, right, right, <laughs> or giving them the right to vote." Because a Baruti says, or no, um, Dr. Khalid says, "You've been allowed to vote." Yes, yes. You, and anytime someone allows, allows you to you. do something, they can disallow you. They can ban you. Or they can allow you to, so that, you, that their agenda still gets fulfilled. Right. Nobody's going to allow you to do something. Right. Well, first, if it was taken from you or not given to you, and then give it to you, they're giving it to you for a reason mm -hmm. of self-interest. Right. And yeah. that self-interest is you continue to participate in their culture mm -hmm. and in their... Yeah. In yeah, their, in in their kind of ceremonies. Yeah. And this is this is the kind of danger of placing equality before sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Because equality is easy to kind of counterfeit. You can go through the motions as if you're the same with somebody, but beneath the surface, it can be the same game, the yep. same hierarchy. Yep. Yep. But you can't fake sovereignty. Nope. Sovereignty is something you feel internally. It's not just something you go through the motions mm -hmm. with. So this kind of push for voting and expanding uh, the vote for Africans in America, it's a way of luring black people into this idea of equality so they will reject sovereignty, yes. so they will reject repatriation, yes. so they will reject retaliation, yeah. so they will reject anything that affirms themselves in the African Africans. Way. Yeah, you no. know, like that's long, not beneficial yeah, to them. Long as you can affirm yourself in the form of your enemy, mm -hmm. it's acceptable. Yep, and that's know? exactly what voting is. So we don't ask in whose eyes are we, you know, participants. We just say, are we participating? Mm -hmm. But if we're participants in the eyes of our enemies, that means we're playing on their side of the chessboard. We're playing on the white side of the chessboard. And you look the black crazy side. to the black, the people on the black side of the chessboard, the black people on the white side of the chessboard look delusional. Mm -hmm. And you think we look crazy. You say we look ridiculous mm -hmm. because we're being Africans, but mm -hmm. we're looking at you like, but mm -hmm. you're on the wrong side side and the white players know you're on the wrong side and guess what they're fine with you being that dumb to think that you can play on their side mm. so what's <laughs> the point now that we're making the point is voting is an accommodationist response to power which can only be sustained by denying your africanity Africans have a revolutionary mandate to retaliate against unjust power mm. and produce their own culturally native forms of power 
And this just builds on the idea that Nana Amos Wilson said, which is every legitimate form of power comes out of a cultural literacy. You know, and once you take away someone's cultural literacy, you take away their sovereignty. What do you have? You take away their ability to produce and to create and to uplift themselves mm -hmm. and, and to defend themselves. Because this is the thing, even the ways in which we defend ourselves are very European based. We don't understand that we ha can't defend ourselves on our enemy's territory. You they know? understand it though. <laughs> they understand it. That's why you mm -hmm. don't see Europeans you know, um, so involved in the, the kind of uh, cultural traditions of Africans. They bring their own European culture into so, the African into environment, the African environment and try to convert right. the Africans to right. their way. Because right. they know once they let go of their way of doing things, they're letting go of their Have power. Have you ever seen a mass amount of white people come to Africa and try to learn African traditions? No. 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 That's not in their benefit. No. That's what you're doing, though. You're in America practicing your real good traditions and wondering why you can't get the things that you're asking for. Mm. You should learn from uh, Master Teacher Yeshua Ben Joseph, <laughs> who flipped yes. the tables of the money changes yes. <laughs> uh, in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask for a seat at the table. No, nope, he was he flipping, flipping them. the tables. And furthermore, after he flipped the table, the chief priests saw him and they said, we want him dead. Yeah, it they wasn't no discussion. They didn't say, let's negotiate with him. Let's figure out what candidate he wants to vote for in the next you know, uh, election in Judea. <laughs> they didn't ask that. They said, how do we get this rebel mm -hmm. to go away? Yep. And that's what we have to become. We have to become rebels and not people who are willing to negotiate over things that shouldn't be negotiable. And how long are you willing to negotiate? Because mm -hmm. you've been negotiating for a long time now, don't you? Because uh, the point of negotiation is to not is to eventually get to a point where you don't have to negotiate, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it seems like every four years you're negotiating mm -hmm. and you're you're deciding between the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. So, so at what point will the negotiations pay off? Mm -hmm. They won't. They yeah. were never meant to pay off. And the negotiation only works when you have something to offer. Yeah. You know, and you have it's like and this you is have the thing. No well. Everything that we have to offer to Yorubu, at least in their eyes, is is involves our degradation. Uh, yeah, right. Like, our lives. There's nothing that we can give Yorubu yep. that will not diminish us yep. as Africans. Yep. And if we truly value ourselves as Africans, we, we will see try. that they're non negotiable. Yep. And we will see the only relation we should have with them is a relation Hostile. of war. A relation of hostility, a relation of uh, protecting the elders and the children and the family mm -hmm. from their invasions. Because they're invasive type people. They don't understand what's theirs is theirs. They say what's theirs is theirs and, and what's, what's ours, ours is theirs. Yep. And you have to understand, they're pushing you. Everything they're telling you to do is it has an agenda at the end. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to, you always have to look. You have to know who you're dealing with. And you have to understand that everything they do, mm -hmm. there's a reason behind it. Mm -hmm. And they, white people, your Yugurugus are very patient. Mm -hmm. They will they will implement laws, and not laws, but they will implement things that take years to come to pass. And they will be patiently waiting. Right. Waiting. Mm -hmm. what, what we're saying is that waiting is getting to its end. Right. It's getting to its end and what, what the agenda and the goal of what Yugurugus want for black people, African people in America, it's about to come to pass. And they yes. know this, yes. they know this. Yes. So this is why you, you see them doing the things that they're doing at a higher level now. You see more and more white people saying that Black Lives Matter and that they care about black people. And you see robots now, white robots saying they're Black Lives Matter and listing things that, black, that white people can do to not be racist. Like, it's a lot of energy being put into the illusion that white people can be redeemable. Right. And there's a reason that, that that is heightened at this time. What we're saying is that it's getting closer. The agenda is be almost being reached. Mm -hmm. The people that have spent so much time and energy implementing these things and implementing um, ways to end and annihilate African people is, is chugging along greatly. And what we're saying is we need, the only way it can be stopped 
or the potential for it to be stopped is for African people in America to wake up mm -hmm. and see that you're on a train and you're you're going somewhere fast right. and it's and it's not it's not in your interest to stay on that train. Right. Right. Like, We're in the burning house. Yeah. Dr. King We're Martin. in the burning house. We're not in the burning house. I mean you're in a burning house. Uh and the house is burning and the foundations are on fire, mm -hmm. you don't run to the sink and try to put it out. You exit the house. You exit. And I feel right now what we're doing is we're trying to go through the flames mm -hmm. to get to the sink. We're trying to go through the flames to get to the toilet. We're trying to find, find water, water in the house. In the using bottled water. Meanwhile, the house is burnt to shreds. And, and we're saying if we don't understand that we're in this burning house, we're going to be engulfed in flames. We're going to perish along with the people who set the house on, on fire, fire in the first place. You know, uh, are we willing to die by the arson of our enemies? No. And, and, and that's what all we're trying to communicate. When Africans decided not to build their own sovereign nations and integrate mm -hmm. with their enemies, mm -hmm. that was the period in which they missed an opportunity. Yes, such so, so, so now we're at a position where we aren't even... Um, in a strong position to attack. So we have to reposition to, to attack better. You know, because if we attack within the burning house, they don't really have to develop a counter strategy because the house is already on, on fire. fire. They can just leave you there. Yeah. All they gotta do is walk away. Because 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 their thing is they they're even willing to annihilate themselves if they can take us with them. You know? That's the type of people you're dealing with. People that are willing to kill themselves to take you with them. Right. If that's not demonic, I don't know what is. So, so while you're fighting them, they're allowing the fire that their ancestors set to consume us. Right. We have to like remove ourselves from that house and say, okay, y'all gonna burn in that house because y'all said I'm fire. Not. We're not. Yeah. We're not. And, and every time you participate in these elections, you're fanning the flame. Yeah. You're allowing it to expand. You're giving it oxygen mm -hmm. when you should be getting. Uh, uh, sh we should be escaping, you know, and not giving the fire that's consuming us and our families more oxygen right. to spread. Right. So, what's the next point? Holding is a diversion tactic deployed by our enemies to keep us firmly enmeshed within their culture of power. In this way, elections so show cultural allegiance above and beyond the political candidates we choose to endorse. We must know who Yorubu is and the culture they hold. Yeah, we say that all the time. You have to know who Yorubu is. Otherwise, America's going to be a lovable place for you. Yes. And the burning house, you'll you'll look at it as, oh, the heat is on. Mm. Instead of the house is on fire. Right, right. Because um, in uh, African traditions, power is allocated based on eldership. Mm. It's based on... Like, what's your value to the village? Right. It's not based on promises. It's based on work right. and deeds yeah. and, and actual and you have to resonance. Earn. You have to earn. You can't just degree yourself into that. Right. Into it. You have to earn. Right. And your character has to be up to par as well. Right. There's no advertising. Either. Yeah, no. Like, an elder doesn't have a campaign for eldership. You, they, they, through their wisdom and through their teaching of yeah. the youth, they become an elder. Mm -hmm. And they so, don't have to sell themselves, yes. like you said, to, to anybody. Yes. It's just automatic. Like, of course, who who, who else is going to run this, this village? Or who else is going to run this country mm -hmm. besides them? Like, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yes. So we have to ask ourselves, how is African people with an African mind, mm -hmm. even though those minds have been attacked, how have we degenerated from a point where we used to operate uh, on a system of eldership to now we're operating on a system of mass-based advertising mm -hmm. so of, we're, we're, of, of our enemies. We're electing celebrities yes. to be run, people who run the country now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yes. Makes sense. But, so what we're saying is, at the end of the day, presidents are already chosen before you even go, before, before the year of the voting year even comes up. Mm -hmm. Like, you really think the shareholders are gonna allow you to have that much say so mm -hmm. in in their corporation? Come mm -hmm. on, it doesn't make sense. Like, mm -hmm. just look at it as a job. Mm -hmm. No shareholder is coming down, even going, usually the shareholders don't even live in, sometimes they don't even live, live in the same state mm -hmm. as the, the, the company. The company. Yeah. They're not gonna go there and say, hey, um, worker that's taking the phone calls, um, what do you? Who do you think should be uh, a shareholder? Who should be chairman? Who, of the board? who should be chairman? 
<laughs> like, come on. Like, let's really break it down on that fundamental level. And it just throws everything out the window. It just becomes, it just doesn't make sense at that point now. And this is especially true when you think about how the wealth of America is generated. Mm -hmm. Because the shareholders in America are not even talking to the white workers. Yeah. So if they're not talking to the white workers, they, they definitely ain't going to talk to, to the, the workers whose ancestors they tortured to get the wealth. Because while they're talking to that worker, they know they might get stabbed. Yeah. They might get attacked right. if that person is operating in their African, African mind. mind. Right. So they, they're not suicidal. They understand mm -hmm. that part of maintaining their power is to remain hidden, to remain behind the scenes, to put their representatives in front of us, to delude us with imagery and propaganda so that we think we're voting for ourselves when we're actually voting for our enemies. Right. Right. And it's so interesting, too, because I don't even hear people talking about shadow governments. No. Like, no. it's not, it's, and it's a known thing, but it's like when voting comes, mm -hmm. the shadow government just goes, it just, now it's not existing. It evaporates. I'm like, but <laughs> there's whole documentary, there's white people talking about the shadow, like, it's a known fact that the people that you see running America are not the people that are running America. It's a shadow government. But it's like when voting comes, all these celebrities just get become a like mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, what? Y'all know these presidents and these vice presidents aren't running anything. They're just mm -hmm. the face mm -hmm. of America. Yes, yes, yes. And like and it's it's so it's crazy. It's crazy. And you have to ask yourself too, who do you think did more killing, Trump or Obama? Cause cause because depending on your answer, I can already tell where your mind is at. Yeah, you're operating, you're operating off of imagery, imagery instead of actual right, study, right. research, and stuff. I didn't ask who has the, the most beautiful family, yeah. who carries itself, who knows how to speak well. Mm -hmm. I asked who has done more killing, Trump or Obama? Yes. And the and answer is Obama. The answer is Obama. Now, does that mean that Trump is a better person than no. Obama? No, what we're pointing out is the image of the chairman of the board has no inf no reflection on who the shareholders are. And know? be careful about what you watch on media because media will paint Trump out to be this evil person, which I'm not saying he's not. He well, is. He's evil. He is evil because he's Urugu. Yes. But he also didn't has not done as much killing as your favorite president. Yes. So we have to ask ourselves: Are we making our political decisions based off of personality? Are and we imagery? basing it off of actual studying policies? Not just policies in terms of how we can affect it, but how are these policies a reflection of a deeper culture that is fundamentally anti-African? A culture so anti-African that they can put an African head of state in office and he executes the anti-African policies in such a way that it exceeds even right. a Yorubu like Donald Trump. Right. You know, that's where we have to kind of begin our analysis. Not at who the family is, right. not at can he speak in eloquence, right. not if, and does he make us feel good, not is he does he sing Al Green in the middle of speeches. All of that stuff is just for people who don't have the critical lens, spiritually empty people, uh, who don't practice the spirit of discernment right. to see who their real enemies, enemies are. are. Right. You know. Right. And who was the vice president for the president who did more killing than Trump? Yes, the, the person who's possibly about to become the next person. So what do you think is going to happen, guys? <laughs> and now he yeah. has his new Obama named Kamala Harris. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is about to happen? They put black people in the White House so they can do even more killing than when white people are in the White mm -hmm. House. It's a public relations um, It's very picture. brilliant, honestly, when you yes. think about it. Yes. But it, but if you're operating from a spiritual realm, you can't be fooled. Mm -hmm. And you can point it out very easily. Yes. And you look at other people who can't point it out like... What's wrong with you? <laughs> so, all, all we're saying is, be careful of what you see in the media. So, and this is the last topic, I think, because we haven't talked about this, the idea of citizenship. And how <laughs> uh, a lot of <laughs> uh, African participation oh, in American rituals like elections are based upon these very flawed, um, imaginary ideas that they're citizens. Right. So a lot of Africans in America, they're like, we are citizens, you know, you know, because are of, you citizens in Africa? Because of the uh, what the Thirteenth Amendment freed us from slavery, really didn't, you know, it but legalized I, slavery, you know, in prisons. So that's the Thirteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment, they say, gave us citizenship. No, the Fourteenth Amendment was designed for who? The shareholders. And what do I mean by that? It was designed to grant personhood rights to corporations. 
Now on the surface, they said it was to uh, give grant citizenship to um, formerly enslaved Africans. But in substance, it was about giving personhood rights to corporations so that they could do what they're doing now, which is monopolize the political process, um, pick their candidates, um, silence out any type of voices of dissent, yep. and then propagandize the population to, be, to believe the that what they're the opposite of what they're actually looking mm -hmm. for. <laughs> so that's your beloved 14th Amendment um, to the Constitution. So once we empty out that propaganda about constitutional rights, what is your citizenship based on now? Okay, it's based on the fact that uh, you were born in America. But just because you're born in a captive environment don't mean you belong to that captive environment. Note that your ancestors had no paperwork to represent your citizenship. So what are we basing it on? We're basing it on the word of our enemies. Our enemies just basically said, okay, you're a citizen now. And you said thanks. And recall, these were people who was right in the thick of the slave society. So you know they believed that Africans was livestock. <laughs> the white, the Yorubus today believe it too, but there was no denying that the people of the 19th century looked at Africans as livestock. Right. So we're basing our citizenship on the word of Yorubus who looked at Africans as livestock. Meanwhile, when you have Africans who repatriate to the, the continent of Africa to be in the presence of fellow Africans and to commune with their ancestors, um, we are flooded with questions about whether or not we're citizens. It's the most Yorubu question. It's a very Yorubu mentality because yeah. it's saying that your citizenship should be based off of who, what your torturer says yeah. and not what your ancestors say. And, and in anything, we have to stop, just dispose of all these kind of, you call it legalese. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. like people in power, they love to kind of uh, overwhelm jargon. you with jargon yeah. and legal terms mm -hmm. in, order to, no in order to get you to kill your critical thought. Because to, they have no substance. And they know they have to overcompensate with right. big words right. and stuff that doesn't make any sense. Ask yourself, is what they wrote on the page, does that align with the reality? And if it doesn't, you can throw it away. I don't care how, what kind of Supreme Court they get to legitimize all of this. If it doesn't align with your lived experience, your African mind, throw it away. Because as Africans, we're the inventors of government. So why are we taking lessons in citizenship and lessons in civics from the people who, we, who our ancestors taught civics? It don't make sense. That's backwards. That's backwards, upside down, and, and inside, inside out. out. Okay? So so part of our kind of evolving out of this mentality that values elections is understanding that the idea of citizenship is meaningless in the mind of an African. You gotta throw all that stuff out and just throw it out and start over. Unless you have a time machine that can undo the torture that, that our ancestors endured at the hands of your Yorubu, then there is no such thing as African citizenship in America. What you have is African captivity, captivity. in the disguise of citizenship. Yep. They letting the captives run around free for a little bit. Mm. And not even free. That's the thing. It's like, what are you, why do you want to be a citizen so bad in America? Like, why? Mm. You're literally being killed as a hobby. Mm. You was and nobody's yeah, your merchandise, and they're doing it now. They're killing you and then paying y'all off. Like mm -hmm. why? I can't fathom why you want that citizenship so bad, unless you have an infatuation with your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I, I recall even the the um, story of Yeshua ben Yosef in the temple of uh, driving the money changers out of the temple. He said, "Why do you make my father's house a place of merchandise?" because they were selling. Now, to expand that, um, and that uh, comparison, we're the merchandise that's being sold in that temple. So Yeshua ben Yosef, he didn't want commercialization. Once you commercialize things, you, you, you destroy the sacredness of it. Yep. And that goes back to what I was saying in the other video. The purpose of slavery was to destroy the sacredness of the African. And that's why they preserved slavery in the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Because even after they go. legally abolished slavery, they had to have a backdoor way of saying, really, we still agree the African is a savage. It was not willing to let that go. And whenever we vote in their elections, we're saying that we agree with 
their idea that we're savages. Yeah. Whether we know it or not, that's the effect of our actions. This is why they're telling you to vote. And this is why they're telling you to vote. This is why they're telling you to walk around with stickers and masks that say vote. This is why they're telling you to, you know, do absentee ballots. This is why they're telling you that anybody vote early, who vote early and anybody who doesn't line. vote is like a kind of, you know, a, a killjoy or somebody who's trying to uh, sow uh, division. It's draining. Like, we really have to just take long breaks from <laughs> social media. Yes. Because it's, it's, so, it's so difficult to watch. Yes, and social media was such a psychological coup for yeah. power. Like, they, it kind of gave them a space cool to gram. infiltrate our mind. Cool gram. It gave us a space <laughs> yeah. to infiltrate our minds in a way TVs never could. Yeah, because social real. media is with us at all times, 24-7. Yeah. We can't escape it. And, and because we can't escape it, they don't want you to escape them. So it doesn't matter if you're thinking outside the box. They're going to make sure you see the images that puts you back into the box. Okay? So if it hasn't been communicated strongly enough, we implore all Africans in America to reject the idea that they have any stake, that the shareholders of America have one iota of concern or care about their destiny and they need to assert themselves as Africans and practice repatriation and retaliation against a system that has been impoverishing them for centuries right. and continues and will continue to impoverish them as long as they believe that they have a stake in this Urugu uh, society right. that and is America. Right. And just be careful what you ask for because you have, you have your enemies telling you what you want, and you have your enemies te telling you one for one, and you're asking for candidates that do not have, I mean, any, no candidate has your best interest, but it's very obvious that um, um, Bye Bye and Kamala, Kamala bye -bye. have y'all, have no interest in, in black people. They just, they're just like the Obama. Yes. They're there to pretend, and they're going to do it very well. But you're going to suffer even more than you would if the annoying Trump was in the office. Yes. I mean, either way, it's a it's a it's a lose lose. That's what we're saying. Either way, you're losing. Mm -hmm. Whether you get what you what you think you want or not, you still lost mm -hmm. because you're in America. Yes. So what we're saying is, don't allocate any more energy towards something that has that's not going to liberate you. Right. You're practicing liberation saying. politics, not prison politics. Period. In prison politics, you're voting for the warden. You aren't, you aren't voting for a revolutionary who's going to make you know who you are. Right. You know. So uh, we hope that this information finds those who haven't voted yet and encourage them to not vote, not vote <laughs> and to leave the prison. And even for people who have voted, we hope this kind of um, triggered within you a kind of reflection that yeah. sees that that was an error in judgment. Right, because we both have voted before. I voted like, before. Just because you've done it before don't mean you have to continue in the right. belief of it. Or even like, this is the thing, because a lot of this is, because uh, ultimately whether or not a black person vote has no effect on the country. Yeah. But the, so the, the main problem with voting is the fact that a lot of Africans vote and then they um, promote the idea of voting yes. and this promotion of voting that's, the that's a cultural indoctrination that mm -hmm. and, and that translates into other parts of our life right. so now we're afraid to fight the system because we just gave the system our approval mm -hmm. by going into the voting booth yeah. so so they're really just um, using the vote to count how many docile people yes, are there. Yes, like how a, many docile black people do we have? How many we don't have to surveil? Right, how many do we <laughs> not have to worry about? You know, yeah, so that's what yeah, yeah. So, so Malcolm X, he said the ballot or the bullet, and Khalid Muhammad said the, the bullet, bullet or, or the, the bullet. bullet. And I'm saying <laughs> the bullet and the bullet. The bullet and the bullet. <laughs> you know. So, so that's that's where we are now. The the idea that the ballot box is some kind of um, political um, key for African progress is an illusion. Yeah. And and, and Which in due time we all know. Yeah, very much so. Thank you guys for watching. We hope this helps in some way. Share this with your friends and family who 
made me some guidance on voting. And thank y'all again for watching. We will see y'all in our next video. All right, for BB for Hody family. For Hody. For Hody.